so yeah, that that's me and uh, various sort of misdirected passions like supporting Tottenham Hotspur, you know. But I'll go, I'll get out, of it, I'll grow out of it sometime. Yes, and afterwork.net, just say a little bit about that. Afterwork.net is is um, something which um, I started a few years ago, and it's designed to to look at the whole all the issues of active retirement. Uh, what people do when they come into this stage of their life as a website. There's uh, a regular sort of blog produced and uh, we have a, a sort of Facebook uh, thing which anybody can join totally free uh, and engage with with the issues that come up on it. But uh, do do have a look at it yourself. I'll, I'll mention it perhaps at the end as well. So you know how to get into it. Wonderful. We'll put the link up in a moment. We'll do that for you. But that, Dave, it's really lovely to have you. Thank you so much for... Um, coming and joining us. I think Kate's going to share your PowerPoint. We're going to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Um, let me tell you how I got into this. Um, I, I was saying, this This is going to sound like name dropping, but I was staying with a guy called John Chapman um, in Australia. And um, he was writing a book at the time called Making the Most of the Rest of Your Life. And this quote was in it. I am 76 years old. You may think it's strange that I'm thinking about making the most of the rest of our lives, humanly speaking. I don't have all that much left. The average male lives for 79 years. That doesn't leave me much time. On the other hand, if there is life after death, if eternity is really eternity, and I have the greater bulk of my life to look forward to, that makes all the difference. Uh, that could only be written by Chapo, I think. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's the way he lived, that's the way he was. And um, that sort of stimulated me to think about this whole area of, of what we do and how we do it and um, the ways in which we, we need to perhaps think a, a little bit little differently than some of the seniors ministry I'd been involved with. So the first point I want to make is beware stereotyping. Um, and my experience from uh, youth ministry would suggest that we so easily um, stereotype. We think all youth, for example, are soaked in youth culture and incapable of anything but grunting. Um, and, and there's a whole range of issues here. And I want to deal with five of them. If we could have the next slide up, Kate, that would be great. Next one, please. That's lovely. Under five headings, we, we need to not just think that, that that's the old people over there. And, and we're going to deal with the old people in a sort of blanket way. And, and I put it under these categories. There are many more, actually. Physically, I, I know a 65-year-old golf man who's had to come off the golf course. He can't play anymore. I know an 85 year old who can walk a five mile golf course and not feel it. So physically, there's a wide range of experience within that range that we sometimes label as senior. Mental, we have those with incredibly alert minds and those through various um, sad things that come their way, the mental slowing down of various sorts. It's not my brief to deal with that this morning, but, but let's be aware that the, in, in the mental uh, field there's a whole range of capabilities there spiritual not all 70 year olds are wise mature believers thank you to david for what he mentioned about with it should wisdom should come with age regrettably sometimes it doesn't um and, and we need to face up to that issue not all 70 year olds are like that many are culturally seniors can come from a whole variety of cultural backgrounds some are looking for a quiet life, leave me alone. I've done my work, get out of my space. I just wanna vegetate in my garden and grow rhubarb. You know, don't, don't get near me. Others are looking for fresh stimuli. What can I do now? Where's the new challenges? So culturally, there's a whole range there. It's certainly in the group that I'm senior, uh, the leader of, is it very, very different in many ways. Sociologically, some Seniors, I find in, in the group, have had enough of human interaction to last a lifetime. They, they don't want to know. Others have had limited um, human interactions and need to be um, left uh, to, to find new places where they can speak, where they can be, where they can live. So these the whole things, beware any, any attempt. These developmental issues need to be considered when we're working with, with seniors. Um, and another factor is that any given individual can shift and change. I've seen this through lockdown. I've done a fair bit of work in contacting people uh, in my, my group 
and and I've seen dramatic change, I think I would call it, of people who have aged, whatever that means, considerably through this process that they've had to go through. And they are different people than they were before. And so what we have in this age range, just like we see again with youth, youth work, we see the same thing. We see this growth in maturity. Um, sometimes in, in seniors, it's a decline. It's a very obvious decline. And we have to work with that sympathetically and empathetically so that these folk will, will be blessed. Next heading is, is this one will throw you completely. This is a throwback to my mathematics days. Um, one to N, whatever that means. Um, let me try and explain what I mean by that. Uh, assume your group numbers are 20. It's easy to think, what am I going to do with those 20? Well, let's have a cup of tea and a bun every now and again, or let's have a lunch club. And there's the end of it. Uh, I, I started thinking a bit more freely than that, because between number one and 20, which is your maximum group, N on your slide there, you, you could be working with any numbers within that group. Just as I learned with young people, you had the big group, but it was vital that you broke that group down into smaller groups for different purposes. And because of the wide ranges of people that, that exist within seniors, my suggestion is that you need to think in terms of, of working as, as one person. Uh, let me give you one or two examples which may help you. This is another name drop, but forgive me. I was working around Willow Creek Community Church. Not many people can say that, but I thought I'd just drop it in for the sake of a bit of fun, you know. And I saw this vacuum repairman. And he was sat on the ground, surrounded by the bits of a vacuum cleaner. And I couldn't resist asking him, I said, what are you doing? He said, um, well, I'm, I'm serving God, which is not the sort of thing that I normally get from blokes who service my vacuum cleaners. But then he explained that he was the one who'd manufactured, designed, manufactured and marketed this vacuum cleaner. So he knew it pretty well. And his job as one man was to go around the campus and serve God by making sure that every vacuum cleaner in the place worked. And that was his role. And he loved it. When I was in ministry at, um, in Christchurch Forward, many of you know that's where I, I led the youth children's team there. And I had a, a little team um, who resourced the youth work. They were people who came in and they mended things that broke. Young people always break things uh, and they mended them. Uh, a caterer was on that team. Um, a retired headmistress who made sure that every single piece of resource that was needed by the youth and children's ministry was got there in time for Sunday or, or midweek. And they were a little team of three and they worked brilliantly together. They prayed together. They prayed for the young people together and they loved serving. And uh, every year I used to take them out for a meal. And they said, we want to go out and do it like young people. So I used to, can you believe this? I took a bunch of four seniors to Pizza Hut every year. Um, and, and we celebrated the fact that we enjoyed being in service ministry together. Um, and one by one, they, they couldn't do it anymore. Another little group that we're just about to start in my church, we are learning to play the ukulele. Not a lot of people do that, but, um, you know, they want to do it. Again, a smallish group, not the N, the maximum, but somewhere between one and N. These little groups meet and they decide that they can work and, and do something which is useful in the community. Let me move on to the next point, number four, central focus. Um, alongside those smaller groups, I think it's vital that we have some kind of um, group that comes together to give that age range um, some kind of identity. In my own context at Christchurch Winchester, it's called Sages. Not my, not my um, sages leave your contemplations was kind of where it came from, but it's senior adults growing, engaging and serving. And that's the kind of value system that we wanted to put together. Senior adults growing. We're not saying that we've got there. We're not those people that, you know, I've been around the Christian block so many times. I know everything. Uh, we, we forget about that idea. We want to engage we're not being distant. We want to engage in, in ways that are appropriate for us. And we want to serve. And, and so that might be a lunch club, but there is a central focus. There is a place where the group gather. We are going to meet 
now that we can hug and meet in 30s, we are going to hit a garden centre next week because we're going to have a, a, a controlled hug, of course. Otherwise, Boris would be very cross with us. Um, but we're going to do it and we're going to meet because we've missed it. And, and that will be something very precious. Um, and we just hope it doesn't rain as it usually does when we go to that particular place. It might be a lunch club. Um, uh, it, it may be, um, now this is different, isn't it, in different sorts of churches. Some churches are run by seniors, so the church is the group. But if that's not the case in a big place like ours, certainly we need to, to realize that um, where a church is largely run by younger leadership, seniors can feel marginalized. And therefore that group identity, that sense of belonging, is important to create in, in one form or another. Um, next one, we believe in intergenerational church. Um, I know this is a very big buzzword at the moment, but it's one that I profoundly believe in. Um, make every attempt to bring all generations together, if at all possible. We had a lovely example in our congregation of a, a gentleman who supported a hospital in Africa for years and years and years, but was unable to do much about it uh, in terms of practicalities because he was nursing a very, very sick wife with rheumatoid arthritis for about 25 years. And when that dear lady went to be with the Lord, uh, we said to Eric, you're gonna go there. And he said, no, I couldn't possibly, I couldn't possibly, no, no, no. He said, yeah, you're going there, mate, get on. We, we, we bought him a ticket so he couldn't get out of it. Um, and, and off he went to Africa and he came back and one of the most profound meetings I have ever been in was when Eric stood in front of Pathfinders. An 85, uh, older than that by then probably, certainly late 80s, telling these people what it was like to live and, and to, to, uh, to, to try and live safely in that sort of territory. Wonderful moment. And I believe we should be very much looking, uh, your leadership, you are leaders here this morning, Look at all the ways in which you can use seniors in appropriate roles. Don't become youth obsessed. Don't become young family obsessed. But realize that all these different facets of a congregation bless each other when they are molded together. And so use them. I, I knew a church in, um, in the Northeast that had a, a, a seniors day. They ran the services for the day. And... Um, not every week, but once a year, it was their day, and it was brilliant. Uh, some of you know that church only too well. It's it's known as the Vardy Cathedral, um, but but it was a fabulous day, just brilliant, all run by seniors, and they weren't boring, I can assure you. Um, and so encourage seniors to um, to to praise younger participants. I had to deal once with a lady who said, "I don't like drums." So until I pointed out to her that drums were very biblical um, and therefore should not be mocked. Um, but, but she was very much, you know, a, a person that could talk down about the young. Encourage people to have positive connections. All our youth interns at church have to spend an hour a month with a senior member of the congregation. And they pray together. And um, one, one of them gets quite stroppy if she's not told the actual things to pray for when this guy is actually serving God in, in the youth group. Now, anything we can do, mix up the coffee rotors. I don't care how you do it, but just cross generationalize That's a great word, isn't it? Um, right across so that these things can, we, we can learn from each other. We can be blessed by each other. Um, six point, create a spiritual dimension. Now this, um, this is something which, which David has dealt with so eloquently that I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on. But, but my experience, particularly in this last year, is that discipleship can waver. People can get a bit lost. I've talked to two people in the last fortnight who've said, uh, basically, they're not assured of their salvation. It's, it's wobbled. And therefore, within the context of what we do, there must be a a discipleship element we we have things like lent courses we had a gathering um not a million years ago just before lockdown where we came together to share doubts and people were there to give decent theological answers to the doubts that people were expressing 
And that was done in a, in a coffee morning context. And we had several of those gatherings. I, I think they proved very, very much there. So in amongst the group, we continue, just as we do with other ages, to, to develop and to put on things which are, are going to encourage discipleship. The after work net, we have a, a little section there where we encourage people to say, now, look, you've, you've got a chance. Now there is time to begin to perhaps read the Bible in a more creative way, to think of times when you could pray, to look at the spiritual disciplines that you're involved with, and so on and so on and so on. I can have more time. I can amplify that a little. Let's move on to the next one, pastoral care. Um, encourage. I don't want to say much about this as it's so obvious, really, but we encourage very much a mutual caring system. Hugh Palmer, when he was at Forward, um, used to put on the bottom of the bulletin, pastors, all the, all the church officers were listed, and then at the bottom it said, pastors, the whole church. And encourage that. We've, we've seen evidence of that in, in my own church over the years, uh, over this last year, of where people have cared for each other been very touching and we've had to sometimes prompt it and and but then there is also the fact that we're not afraid to use proper um agencies who need to come in times of illness of dementia and so on don't be afraid to go that way but let's develop caring in in positive and creative ways eighth point the community i think it's very important to ignore the fact that there is a community out there. I encourage my group to have something um, that is outside of the context of the church. Some of them go to UCA. I go to golf club every week. It's the greatest mission field on the planet. Four hours and they can't get away from you. It's almost like Paul and the Philippian jailers, isn't it? You know, they can't get away from you for four hours. They're stuck with you. And the number of times I get odd cracks, if I sink apart, you know, oh, you must have been on your prayer mat. You know, little cracks like that and say, well, you could be there too. And the 90s hole is wonderful. Every, every week almost there's a conversation. Oh, you're one of them, aren't you? Or something like that, you know. Um, I know a church quite close to me here in the South that have engaged with a, a GP surgery. And uh, again, another one of my sort of things that we, we love to talk about here is, is the business of loneliness. And what that GP surgery after proper checks are done is that people become visitors to lonely people. Is it 9 million lonely people in the church? Eleanor Rigby died and was buried along with her name. Nobody came. Loneliness, my friends, is a very, very serious issue. I once visited a man um, when it was snowing and his response to me when I knocked on his door was, um, why do you only come when it's Christmas or it snows? I've left out one or two words for your delicate ears, but that was the gist of what he said to me. And I think there's something here which we could engage with, um, which all our sages are now beginning to see. Let's visit a lonely person somewhere in our patch. Um, nine, evangelism. Huge area here, and I haven't got time to develop it, but uh, we are beginning to look at strategies as to how we can meet. Um, we have a planned evening. Um, we're going to, this is going to sound terrible on a Keswick tape, but James, you might want to edit this out. Um, but we're going to go to a pub and we're going to have a Skittles evening and we're going to invite all our buddies along. We did it once before and the lady who won was nearly totally blind. We still laugh about it today, but how you win a Skittles evening like that. But it was fun. It was good. And lots of people were joined into that and have stuck with us since. And we're beginning to see them wanting to do things. When we get back and we can do this properly, um, it's, it's something which we can do, uh, hopefully, in an exciting way. And have a project, number 10. Look outwards. Get engaged. We're at present negotiating with Tear Fund about a project to engage with some seniors um, in Rwanda. Uh, because that generation below them is not there anymore, largely because of the civil war and you know, I'm generalizing grossly there, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and we're going to engage with them as a project. And finally, just to mention after work net again, do uh, please just um, join up with us. It's very simple. Just just go onto the website um, and you can sign up and you'll get a weekly or fortnightly blog 
uh, depending on how Pete and I can get it done, you can join the Facebook network and uh, please, please join up and, and tell us your views, what you're doing. We want to hear what you're doing. It's a forum for exciting ideas for what we can do with seniors um, in their years, for us particularly, of active retirement. And I know Carl does something similar with Faith in Later Life. So that's just a few thoughts about um, what you can engage with. Um, it's, it's very generalized. It's very quick. Um, and there's more to come if you want it. But join the website. That's all I can say. James, that's me finished. Dave, thank you so much. There's so much again, so many practical, um, creative ideas, encouragement for us all to reflect on and to think through as we minister with seniors and encourage.